Open your Bibles with me again this morning. Let's start in the book of Psalms together. We've got some church business to take care of today, some body of Christ business. And I want to start this morning in the book of Psalms. And I want you to look beginning in the fourth chapter, Psalm chapter four, and we'll look at verse eight. And I want you to listen quick today. I've got quite a bit of scripture to share with you. There's some things we need to deal with, some serious things in the spirit of God and in the realm of the spirit. Psalm chapter four, verse eight, the Bible says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Listen to it again. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. The Good News translation reads like this. When I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe, perfectly safe. We've been talking for a number of weeks in here about what God is desiring to do in our lives and in this church. And we, we got a word from him at the beginning of this year from the book of first Peter chapter five that says the God of all grace, who's called us according to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you've suffered a while, he will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And when we are in that condition and when God has gone to work to do that in our lives, what are we? We are better than ever. Better than we've ever been because of the work of God's grace in our life and in our family. And we've been talking about that word perfect and what it actually means from the scripture, not what we think of it as in the way we use it in, in our language, in our culture. Through the scripture, it has a different meaning. It has to do with being developed. It has to do with, with growing up, with maturing. And we've come to see that it has to do with being complete. So not necessarily flawless or perfect in that sense that you never miss it, you never make a mistake, but perfect in the sense that you are complete. Perfect in the sense that you are developing, maturing, growing up. Perfect in the sense that you've got the equipment that God needs you to have that comes through the preaching of the word of God, that comes through the ministry, through his ministry gifts, the perfecting, the equipping of the saints to do the work of your ministry. Somebody say, I have a ministry. Well, to have that ministry and do that ministry and fulfill that ministry and complete that ministry, you got to be complete. You've got to be equipped. You need some equipment to do it. So we've talked about how this perfecting and perfection really just means being complete. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says, you are complete in him. I like just saying it. I am complete in him. Why don't you say it with me? I am complete in him. That means there's not anything missing. That means you are not an incomplete puzzle. That means you are not a broken person. You are not a fracture or a fraction of a person. You are complete if you're in him. When you are in him, complete. Did you notice this verse though and the way it was worded? Look again at Psalm chapter four, verse eight, at that good news translation. He said, when I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me, say it with me, perfectly safe. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Well, based on what you know about what the word perfect means, how else could you say that? You alone, O Lord, keep me completely safe. In Psalm chapter 138, we'll put this on the screen for you. The New King James translation reads like this. Although I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand will save me. The Lord will, can you see it? Perfect. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. 
Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Listen to it again. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. You see it here on your screen. I want you to say it out loud with me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Say it again. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. What will he do with the things that concern you or the things that have to do with your life? He will perfect. He will complete these things. But it's important to note what he said in connection to this completing work that the Lord does in our lives. How did this verse start? In verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you revive me. Again, the Good News translation. Guys, do we have that? Can we put that on the screen? Psalm 138, verse 7 in the Good News translation. I'll let them look for it. Let me read it to you. He said, when I am surrounded by troubles, you keep me safe. You oppose my angry enemies and save me by your power. You will do everything you have promised. Lord, your love is eternal. Complete the work that you have begun. So that's the way that translation bears out that, that thought of him perfecting the things which concern you. What's he saying? Complete the work that you've started in me. That reminds me of what the New Testament said. Things that we, we pray, we prayed just a moment ago. That the good work that he began in you, he is faithful to complete it. He's faithful to finish it. Or perfect it. Perfect this work. Complete this work that he started in you. But did you notice in both of these scriptures what he talked about, whether it was perfect protection or perfecting the work, completing the work in you? Both of these were connected to our safety. Both of these things had to do with you and I being in the midst of trouble. In a troubling situation, you and I being in and in the midst of enemies. And it's in the middle of that that he says, I've got you. It's in the middle of that that he says, I'm going to finish this work. Now think about it. What would the connection between those have to be? Well, if he's going to not only start something good in you and start something good in me, but if he's going to finish it all the way and complete it all the way, what's that mean? That means you're going to have to be protected. That means in the middle of this world and in this life full of crazy things and crazy people, you are going to have to make it all the way to the end, which means you are going to have to be shielded. You are going to have to be protected. Stuff's going to have to come your way and not affect you and not hit you and not touch you and not take you out if he's going to complete this work. Can you now see the connection between these two things? For him to finish what he started, you got to make it all the way. You want to just say it? It just feels good to say it. Trust me. I'm going to make it all the way. I am going all the way. Now, to do that, you're going to have to be protected. Now, you know why I'm talking to you about this this morning, don't you? We saw some things happen in our nation. Just in this last few days, things that we've seen uh, on a national stage before, things that we've witnessed, and sad to say, we've witnessed too many times. But we saw it again just this week when somebody went into a school with a loaded gun and did great damage and took the lives of children and adults. The only thing to me that's nearly as grotesque as something like that when it happens is what happens right after. Did you notice it took all of about five seconds for people on this side to start blaming people on that side? And for people on that side to tell the folks on the other side, you have blood on your hands. This is your fault. You did this. And though we've seen it over and over, something 
different occurred in me. And I don't know about you as you've watched these things unfold this last week, but something different hit me. And I'm going to be real honest with you. My heart got really heavy about it to the point where the Lord had to really arrest me and say, do not read another thing about this. And I'd go to look at something and he'd have to stop me. He'd have to stop me. And I want to, I want to admonish you, I guess, with the same thing he did me. Watch out. When you're going back and looking at these things and, and looking at the story from this angle and looking at the story from that angle and look at what this one has to say and look at what that one has to say. If you'll notice, it has an effect on you. And there's a couple of things that start to try to happen when you watch these things and then you try to live through the aftermath and all the talk, the, the endless, just ceaseless talk, 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 talk. One of the things you have to watch out over is anger. It's anger. And you might think, well, you should be angry. These things should make you angry. Yes, but at who? Because here's the real danger in a situation like this. When something so evil as that takes place and immediately people start finding fault and blame and putting blood on the hands of one another, you know, what, you know what's going on at the same time? Man's real enemy and the one who did it sits in a dark corner and laughs because nobody blames him. So you want to get angry? Get angry. But watch out who, who you show that anger towards. Are you following me? Yes, sir. We have promises here that we've just read from the word and in various places that the Lord will protect us. Amen. That the Lord will protect our families. Yep. That the Lord will protect our children. Yes. And we're going to look at some of that today. But we're going to look at the way he goes about it. Folks, this is how the believer responds to the things we've seen this week. Watch and beware of how you respond to it. There is always, no matter what has happened, there is always a faith response. And there's always a different one than that. There's a flesh response. There's a fear response. There's a worry response. But if you look in the word, you will find there is a faith response. And as believers, it is upon us and it is our responsibility to respond to anything and everything in faith. We're going to look at some of how God protects and his plan to protect. And we even see in these scriptures we've already read that it is a plan of perfect protection, complete protection. I mean, can he really do that? Even in this world that we're living in, does God have the power to protect? When you think about God protecting and, and what it would take, whether it was God trying to protect you or, or people without God trying to protect themselves, when things like this take place, I, I, I know I've thought it. I know many of you have thought it. People all over, all over the world think it. Where can I go? Where can I go to get away from this mess? Where can I go that I would be totally shielded from any craziness like this? Where can I go that I would be perfectly safe? What can I do to perfectly protect myself? What can I do to perfectly and completely protect my children and to make sure no harm ever comes their way? Well, listen to me. There is no such place. You can search this entire planet top to bottom all the way around. And oh yeah, you think you found the most distant, the most remote island that nobody's ever seen, nobody's ever heard of. And if I could just go there, I could live perfectly protected. You're kidding yourself. There is no place on this cursed filled earth that you could go that the place has the power to protect you. Did you notice what the psalmist said? You alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. In other words, I can't do it. I cannot perfectly protect myself, and I can't perfectly protect my kids. You can't. 
You can wrap them in bubble wrap. You can put a football helmet on them every day before they go out the door. You can take every measure that you can think of to try to perfectly protect your children. Oh, and yeah, you know, you might keep them from falling down and, and bumping their arm, but you can't protect them from the words they're about to hear when their friends see them walking in with a helmet and bubble wrap around. Now what are you going to do? Huh? How are you going to protect the heart? How are you going to protect their soul? What are you going to do about that? You don't have the power to perfectly protect. I don't have the power to perfectly protect. Come on, help me out, church. Who alone has the power to perfectly protect you, perfectly, completely protect your family, your children, and to complete the good work in you? Who's got that power? God and God alone. God and God alone. You alone, O oh Lord, perfectly protect me. You alone, O oh Lord. Make me dwell in safety. You alone, O oh Lord, complete the good work that you've started in me. I can't do it. And you cannot protect your children on your own. The Lord alone has the power to perfectly protect. In the book of Psalms, we're here, but look at the 91st Psalm with me. Ever heard of this one? Psalm 91. We're going to do something, church, something we've never done before. Get up. Go ahead right now. Get up. Stand up. We are going to read the 91st Psalm together. And you're going to read it out loud. I'm going to read it out loud with you. And we are going to lay claim to the perfect protection that is promised to us in this Psalm. Can we do that together? I'm going to have this on the screen. I'm going to read to you out of the New King James Bible. If you don't have that, I want you to look on the screen and read along. Guys, let me know when you've got that. Here it is. Let's read this together. and We're going to receive and believe every single word of it, beginning in verse 1. Ready? Read it with me. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Glory, 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 glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. That's perfect protection. That is complete protection. 
That is saving you in the noontime. That's saving you in the nighttime. That's satisfying you with what kind of life? Long life. And showing you his salvation. Amen? Glory to God. You can sit down. Perfect protection. Now, what I said to you a moment ago is that there is no place. So if you've been looking for it, if you came to the mountains looking for it, there's no place geographically on this planet that offers perfect protection. It comes from God and God alone. So what am I saying to you? Don't try to hide yourself. Don't try to find a location that you put your trust in that spot, in that place. Don't try to find natural things to put your trust in. Your trust belongs in the Lord. Help me say it, Lord. Even though there's not a, a remote island or a place hidden in the mountains that you can go, there is such a thing as hiding in plain sight. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes this morning. Hiding in plain sight. How to live in God's perfect protection. Amen. Are you familiar with that, that expression, hiding in plain sight? It's almost like it was right in front of you, but for whatever reason you didn't see it. You just you glanced right past it. That's the way you and I can live in this crazy, messed up world. Surrounded by people crazy people and crazy things and, and madness and weirdness going on all around us, you can live hidden in plain sight. Amen. And one of the things that we've got to understand in the aftermath of an event like we saw this past week or things that we've seen in years past, you've got to get this. And this is what the rest of the world does not get. There are spirits involved in this stuff. Demonic spirits and people right away you notice what happened they start fighting they start fighting with each other and like we've already said they start laying blame and it's all the same talk over and over and over well we need these laws well we need these laws well we got to protect these rights well and and you know what M maybe there's something and we need to be praying for our political leaders we need to be praying for our legislatures God give them the wisdom to know what to do to address some of these things. But I'm going to tell you something, church. You cannot legislate demons into submission. It's not going to work. You cannot pass enough laws to get evil out of the hearts of people. You can't do it. So pass all the laws you want. But don't be surprised when this stuff still happens because there's evil in this world and there's demonic spirits that people have opened themselves up to and they are influenced by. Now, as I'm saying this to you, if, if liberal, quote unquote, media and mo much of the rest of this world and sad to say much of the rest of the church, they hear us talk like this, they roll their eyes. Oh, give me a break. Evil spirits, please. Fine. Don't believe it. I'm going to go with the word. We're going to go with the word and we are going to recognize that, that what is seen in this realm, this, this natural physical world is not all there is. And there is a spiritual world. There's a whole other realm that is just as, if not more so real than the one you and I are physically sitting in right now. And when this kind of stuff takes place, demons do not look at the laws that are on the books. Uh, sorry, Satan, uh, we can't influence this one. They have passed laws. It's not going to happen. People open themselves up to this stuff. And they are influenced. And they are manipulated by the devil himself. And there's not a single person pointing, not on the news anyway, pointing their finger at him. Well, I am. I'm pointing my finger straight at him today. I am laying every ounce of blame for what happened to those families on the shoulders of man's enemy, the accuser of the brethren, the, the one who steals, kills, and destroys. I lay the blame squarely on him and not on anybody else. I do not wrestle with flesh and blood, and you don't either. 
Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. We're going to have to know how to put ourselves and our children in this secret place. You got to know where it is, how to find it. Did you notice that Psalm 91 started with he who dwells in the secret place? That tells you there are some that dwell there and there are some that don't. And God is not the one that puts you in it. You and I put ourselves in that place. He does the protecting for the ones that put themselves in that place. How do we live in God's promise of perfect protection? Well, verse two of that Psalm, there's a big key in it. He said, I will say of the Lord. I'm going to get to that in just a moment, but, but let's do it like this. Fast forward to, to verse five. How to live in God's perfect protection, hiding in plain sight. Notice what he said here. You shall not, verse five, Psalm 91, verse five. You shall not be afraid. One of the big keys to living in God's perfect protection is identifying fear recognizing fear for what it is and for what it is not. And when these events take place, people who don't know how to think about these things, they think about them isolated, you know, that particular event from its beginning to its end and everything that took place. And, and that event happened on this such and such day at this such and such time. That's not the way our enemy sees these things. Your enemy and the instigator of these things not only is aiming at taking out life and breaking people's hearts and, and hurting a community, he's interested in exactly what we've already talked about, the aftermath of it. He's interested in the strife that comes as the result of it. And even more than that, he's interested in a wave of fear sweeping across families across an entire nation. This is really what he's after. The event itself, that's just the thing. That's just the tool he's using to endeavor to get fear in the hearts and the minds of parents and grandparents and children from coast to coast, north to south, east to west. This is the big goal right here. Get fear in people. Get fear in people. So, if you and I are going to hide ourselves in plain sight, and if we're going to receive God's gift and his promise of perfect protection, we're going to have to identify this fear and recognize it right away. Let me give you this morning in just a few minutes here. Let me give you three things that fear is. Okay. But I want to start with what fear is not. Fear is not a feeling. Fear is not an emotion. Now, there are feelings that accompany it. There are, there are emotions that go with it, but fear itself is not a feeling. Are you following me? Say it out loud. Fear is not a feeling. Fear is not an emotion. When the world approaches fear and they talk about it as a feeling and to them all it is is a feeling and all it is is an emotion, you end up with Therapists, you end up with counselors, you end up with uh, psychoanalytics that give you an approach to fear, and their approach to it is, here's how you accept it. Here's how you manage it. Here's how you cope with it. And when the world offers this, I don't blame them, I don't judge them. They don't know any better. When it comes to fear, the very most they can hope to do is accept. The very most they can hope to do is to somehow manage and to somehow cope with the fear. Where I really get frustrated is when that trash makes its way into the church and believers are preached to from the platforms, here's how you accept your fears. Here's how you manage your fears. Here's how you cope with your fears. 
Man, when you start hearing that kind of stuff, and if you're hearing it from the platform, from some unbelieving preacher, or from some therapist that a preacher's turned their platform and pulpit over to, there ought to be something that rises up in you that says, okay, wait, if the world wants to think that way, fine, but there's supposed to be a difference between the way they think and the way I think, the way they preach and the way I preach. And I, as a believer and a child of God, was never created to accept fear. I was created to resist it. I was never created to manage fear. I was given the authority to master it. Why cope with fear when you can conquer it? But if all you ever do is recognize, well, fear is a feeling and fear is an emotion. So what do we do with our emotions? Well, we don't pretend they don't exist and, and we just have to accept them as a part of who we are. And we just have to learn to manage these things. And we just have to learn to, to cope with these things. You can learn that if you want. But I'm going to go with the word of God that teaches me not to accept, but to resist, not to manage, but to master, not to cope, but to conquer in the name of Jesus when it comes to fear. When we think, well, why do I have to conquer feelings? It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. Well, if it's not a feeling, if it's not an emotion, let me give you the first thing that fear actually is. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven, put this on the screen. You don't have to turn there. Second Timothy one, verse seven, you know it. God has not given us a feeling of fear. God has not given us an emotion of fear. Come on, help me out. What's it say? God has not given us a... What is fear? It's a spirit. It's a spirit. And like I said, I know feelings go with it. I know emotions go with it. But what it is... And this is what the child of God must understand about it. It's a spirit. And what else do you see from this scripture? It ain't from God. God is not the author of this stuff. He's not the source of it. He did not give it to you. And church, if he didn't give it to you, what are you doing with it? What are you doing putting up with any of it? in your home, in your life, in your family. I know the rest of the world is scared about sending their kids to school. You don't have any business being scared of that. You don't have any business letting that fear rule you, dominate you, and dictate to you what you and I do in and with our children. We can hide ourselves in plain sight, live in God's perfect protection if we will deal with this spirit. And I mean deal with it. Don't let it deal with you. You deal with it. God has not given me a spirit of fear. Spirits, evil spirits, manipulate. Evil spirits deceive people. And the spirit of fear is working in the hearts and the minds and the lives of people all over the world. And the decisions they're making, the decisions they're making in their homes, their Families and finances, all of it is so fear-driven. There are people in ministry making decisions about their churches, about their ministries, rooted in fear. Well, I can't say that because I'm afraid somebody's going to leave. I can't do that. I'm afraid somebody's not going to give. I can't do that. I'm afraid I'm going to lose the only help I've got. I don't know if you're interested or care or not, but you're looking at a free man. I am not, I love you, I'm for you, I'm with you, but I ain't afraid of you. We should not be living motivated with this spirit of fear because it's not a gift from God. And yet people treat it like it is. They reverence it like it is, that it's something to be accepted, that it's something to be managed and coped with. And if that's all the world can do with it, fine. And the reason it's made its way into the church is because to a degree, it works. People get to the place where they cope with it. People come to the place where they have it under control and managed. But I'll ask you again, why cope when you can conquer? Why cope when you can conquer? Created to conquer. So identify the first thing that fear is. It's a spirit. And it's not one from God. What has he given you? In place of a spirit of fear, he's given you power. He's given you love. 
and a sound mind. Listen to the way it reads, though. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Or you could say it like this, a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of a sound mind. That's what God has given you. And anything else must be resisted. Not accepted, resisted. Number two, what else is fear? In Hebrews chapter two, verse 14, let me put this on the screen for you. It says, inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, talking about Jesus' death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release. Come on, you're about to find out the whole reason Jesus went to the cross, the whole reason he went to the heart of the earth and rose up victorious. It's right here. To release, somebody say release. release. Those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What was it that kept people all their lifetime subject to bondage? Fear. The fear of death which is what all fear is rooted in. The fear of death, the fear of irrecoverable loss. The fear of death is the, the, the granddaddy fear, if you will, of every other fear that there is. And I know there's a list of phobias 10 miles long, but you can sum them all up with this. It's the fear of death. And it's the fear of death that keeps people in bondage. Did you notice that? And what Jesus did, glory to God, on the cross was to destroy the devil and his works and to release, to release everybody who had been in bondage because of fear. So number one, fear is a spirit. Number two, and people don't know this. You're, you're learning something today that the rest of this world does not know. Fear is a prison. It keeps people locked up. Feelings don't do that. Emotions don't do that. Spirits do that. And fear is a spirit and it's a prison. It's a prison. Several years ago, Sarah and I were with the kids and we were driving from our home in Fort Worth. We were actually going to her old hometown, Russellville, Arkansas. We'd been invited there to minister in the church she grew up in and we we're going with the kids and our route took us out of Fort Worth, out of Texas, up through Oklahoma and we were going to go to Arkansas. And I remember we were driving along and it was kind of a, it was an Oklahoma country road, you know, not a lot out there. And as we're driving on my right hand side, side, I saw this large yellow sign, really like bam yellow, you know, like get your attention yellow with these big black block letters. And the sign said, hitchhikers may be escaping inmates which was a sign I'd never seen before. <laughs> Hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. And my first thought was, okay, great information. <laughs> but then I realized about a quarter mile later why the sign was there. Because on my left-hand side as we drove was this massive facility with huge tall walls and razor wire fence surrounding the whole thing. I don't know how many square miles it covered. It was huge. And it all began to make sense. Here's a prison. And what they're warning you is that somebody may be looking for a ride who's just escaped. And, and I thought the whole thing was kind of amusing and funny. It never left my mind. For the next two or three days, we got to town. We, we prepared for service. I could not stop thinking about that yellow sign. Hitch, hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. And I started looking up what prison this was. And, and I started reading about it. And there was, I think, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 men who were locked inside this prison. And the Lord began to talk to me about it and just paint pictures in my heart of what that was. And I was remembering those big walls that I saw and the fences that surrounded the place and, and, and every brick in that wall and every link in that chain, they all served one purpose. It was to keep people in, to limit freedom, to restrict 
mobility. Those walls, every day a man woke up inside that prison and he walked outside and he saw those walls. Those walls were telling him, you can't go any further than this. This is as far as you go. You don't go any further. You don't get outside this. You don't experience anything outside this. And that's when the Lord took me to the scripture in Hebrews and talked to me about the work of what Jesus did for us in releasing us from the prison of fear. But when people live dominated by the spirit of fear, it's like they wake up every day and that spirit's talking to them saying, you don't go any further than this. This is as far as you go in life. This is all the freedom you get to experience. You don't make any progress past this. And because there's fear, they never take a step of faith. They don't step outside those walls. They don't step beyond those restrictions, whatever they may be. People live locked up in this prison of fear. But I believe this morning, I'm looking at a room full of escaping inmates. Am I right? People who Jesus has released from the prison of fear. People whom he has set free and fear does not tell them, does not dictate to them how far they can go, what, what lengths they can stretch to. They are living by, I'm talking about you now, living by faith, excited about the future, stepping out over into the unknown, not afraid of what's in front of you, not afraid you're going to come short, not afraid you're going to get hurt, not afraid that your children are going to be hurt. Mm -mm. You, you busting out of that prison. I said, you're coming out of that prison. In Jesus' name. But you got to identify it. You got to have eyes that see this and recognize hey, this is more than a feeling. <laughs> Reminds me of a song. This is more than just an emotion I'm dealing with here. There's a spirit trying to, trying to lay hold of my life. There's a spirit that's tried to get on me and my family. And many people, they don't recognize it as that because it's the same stuff their mom dealt with. It's the same stuff their dad dealt with. And it's been generation after generation after generation. People talk about generational curses. Well, what about the fear that gets handed down from one to another? You want to put a stop to that in your family? It's going to have to stop with you. Recognize it though. This is a spirit and it's not from God. And if, it, if he didn't give it to me, I don't want it. I have no business with it. I resist it. Amen. Amen. Recognize it. Have I been living in a prison? Locked up? Unwilling to step out by faith? Huh? Have I been living in bondage to this fear? Not, not launching out into my own, not launching out into the things that God's put in my heart. There are people who have had businesses of their own in their hearts, but fears kept them in prison. Oh, what if it doesn't succeed? People have had building in their heart. They've had expansion in their heart, but that prison of fear says, no, this is as far as you go. Why? Well, it's as far as your dad went. It's as far as his dad went. So it's as far as you go. That's a prison. And you can escape. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Fear is a spirit. Fear is a prison. Now here's something else people don't realize. Number three. This is what the Bible says in the book of Job, chapter 3, verse 25. It says, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Church, we've got to understand fear is a spirit. Fear is a prison. And fear is a magnet. It's a magnet. In just the same way that faith Faith in God and faith in his word has the ability to reach out and lay hold of all that is good in God and bring it into your life. Fear does the exact same thing. Fear reaches out, lays hold of all that is bad in this world, in the realm of the spirit. Fear lays hold of depression. Fear lays hold of oppression. Fear lays hold of sickness and disease, poverty and lack. Fear lays hold of all of it, grabs hold and brings it into the here and now. Fear is a magnet and it will actually work to bring into your life the thing you're so afraid and trying to keep out. 
Fear trying to keep it away from you, kids. Fear trying to keep it away from you. Fear trying to set up all these natural things that, that keep, keep the bad guy away. But you don't realize that fear is actually acting like a magnet, sucking that stuff into your life. But people don't recognize this, do they? They don't have eyes that see this. It's a feeling. It's an emotion. One to be accepted. One to be managed. One to cope with. But man, when you recognize this, this mess is a spirit. And I'm not supposed to accept this spirit. I'm supposed to re resist this spirit. This stuff is a prison. I'm not called to manage this. I'm called to master this. And this stuff is a magnet. Why would I want to cope with the thing that's opening the door to destruction in my life? Who wants to cope with that? What should you be doing with it? Conquer. You are called and created to conquer. It's a spirit. It's a prison. It's a magnet. So now what do we do? Now that we recognize that, give me just a couple of minutes and I'll tell you how to resist it. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 34, verse 3, look, put this on the screen. I want everybody to see this. Psalm 34, verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, cool. We're finding out stuff we can do together. This is like group activity here. What should we be doing together? Magnify the Lord with me. I'm going to magnify him. You want in on this? Let's do this together. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name, how? Together. This is what we do together. But look at what it's connected to in the next verse. Go to verse four. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he helped me accept all my fears. I sought the Lord and he helped me manage my fear. Bad translation? I, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he helped me cope. No? Come on, say it with me. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me. Does that sound like he released you? Like he set you free? He delivered me from nearly every one of my fears. From like 50% of my fears. I'm coping with the rest. I'm managing the, no, he delivered me. Come on, I'm preaching because you need to hear this. He delivered me from all my fears. But how did he do it? What was it connected to? Well, what was the verse before it? Magnify the Lord. This is how you do it. This is how you hide yourself in plain sight. This is how you live in God's perfect protection. You magnify him, not the problem, not the pressure, not the attack. You magnify him. You exalt him. And you've heard me say it to you before, but what happens when you magnify something? Come on, help me. What happens when you magnify it? You said it gets bigger, right? Everybody always says that. But let me ask you something. Does it actually? You put a magnifying glass on the pages of your Bible. Do those words actually change size? No, they just get bigger to you. They just get bigger in your eyes. That's what magnifying does. Now you want to magnify the Lord? Do it. You ain't making him bigger. He is as big as big gets. But what is happening is he's getting bigger to you. He's getting bigger in your eyes. And you can magnify something to the point where you enlarge it, enlarge it, enlarge it to the point where it is all you see. And it takes up every inch of your field of vision. And what happened to the problem? Huh? What happened to the pressure? What happened to the evil going on? It's, it's out there. This is what I'm looking at. I magnify the Lord. And if you need help with that, that's cool. That's what Sunday's about. That's what Sunday's about. So what do you think you should be doing on a Sunday? Get in here and we'll magnify the Lord together. We'll exalt his name together. And guess what's going to happen to fear? It will leave you. As you magnify him, you are resisting that fear. Magnify the Lord. This is the first way we resist it. Another way. We use our words. Amen. What did the psalmist say in chapter 91, verse 2? I will say of the Lord. 
He's my refuge. He's my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You want to hide yourself in plain sight? You want to learn how to live in God's perfect protection? Use your words. You ever said that to a little toddler? Use your words. Come on, say it. Use your word. You say that to a kid who you know can say something. You say that to a kid who you know can do something other than cry, who can do something other than whine and complain. <laughs> Baby, use your words. I'm hungry. Thank you. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> You've been given the word of God. And the Bible says the word of faith is near you. It's in your heart and, and, and in your mouth. Jesus himself said, by your words, you are justified. By your words, you are condemned. The book of Proverbs says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. So use your words. Get your words working over your family. Get your words working over your children. Say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God in whom I trust. And say it and say it and say it and say it. And when something pops up on the news and there's been some other attack and some other tragedy and Satan's been able to do some other thing in people's life and your, your kids go, Daddy, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You're going to say, come on, baby, stand up. This is what we're going do. We're going to say of the Lord, he is our refuge. We will say of the Lord, he is our fortress. He is our God. He's the one we trust. And what are we going to do, mommy? What are we going to do, daddy? We're going to trust God and he's going to protect us. He is going to put us in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people. He's going to hide us in plain sight. And you can tell him nothing to be afraid of. There is nothing to be afraid of. And you know what they'll say? Okay. They're built to trust you. Yes. And when they see this confidence in you, fear has to leave them. Amen. But it's got to be coming out of your mouth. Yes. Dads, I'm looking at you. Take the leadership in this. It's got to be coming out of your mouth every single day. And part of my responsibility as dad in the house, nearly every day, I'm the one that drives the, drives the kids to school. We've got just a few minutes, but you know what? We take those minutes. And before they get out of the car, I declare the blessing of the Lord over them. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. I tell them that they will, they will live out the full number of their days in life, in health, in peace. I say, go be a blessing to somebody today. I pray over them, declare the word over them. I'm not letting them go into this crazy world without being hidden in God's perfect protection. I'm not a fool. We've got to have this coming out of our mouth. Use your words. Amen? Amen? Magnify the Lord. Use your words. And then finally, and this is a big one. Well, let me say this before I move on. We printed this up for you guys, you families and everybody at the beginning of this last school year. And this is one of the things we look to often in our house. It was a card that we gave to all the kids at the top. It just said, who am I? And it goes through, I don't know, 20 different confessions here every one of them based in the word, and there's a scripture reference next to it that tells them who they are in Jesus, who they are in God. And there's several of these that I've gone through and I've highlighted that have specifically to do with their protection. Don't take this stuff lightly. You're doing more for them by, by putting these words in their heart than you would be by strapping a Kevlar vest to them putting a helmet on their head, trying to find some isolated place somewhere where nothing could ever get to them. No, we got a life to live. We got a ministry to fulfill. We got an assignment to do in this world and we can't find some deserted island and try to hide from our enemy. But what we can do is hide ourselves in plain sight. Some of these confessions, they say, I'm more than a conqueror, not a coper, a conqueror through him who loves me. I'm a disciple taught of the Lord. Great is my peace and my undisturbed composure. One says, I am protected and no weapon formed against me will prosper. One says, I'm surrounded with a shield because I trust in him. Here's one that says, I'm an heir of salvation and he gives his angels charge over me. One says, I am full of the spirit and greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. This one says, I'm an overcomer. I overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
And this one says, I'm always in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people. Get these words in their mouths. And then finally, here's how we resist fear. In Mark chapter four, well, I don't take time to turn there, but you remember this account. It's at the end of the chapter in Mark chapter four where Jesus had just spent the entire day preaching and he comes to the disciples and he gets in the boat and he says, let's go to the other side. And the Bible says they put him in the boat as he was and there was lots of little boats with him and, and they launch off the shore there and they're going to the other side. Well, he goes into the, I guess it's the back part of the ship or whatever and he falls asleep. He goes to sleep. Well, in the middle of this journey, you remember what happens, right? The Bible says this great storm arose out of nowhere. This is demonically inspired stuff. You know Satan is in this. All you got to do is read about where they were headed and what they were going to do. There's a demon-possessed man that's been terrorizing that whole countryside on the other side. And Jesus is going to set this man free. And Satan's doing everything he can to keep Jesus away from this man. Because if he sets this man free, then that grip of fear that that demonic spirit has had over that whole, whole region is gone. So what's Satan trying to do? He's trying to keep these people in the prison of fear. And he's doing it by trying to take Jesus out on the way to where he's going. But Jesus is there asleep. And this storm comes up. It's sudden. It's severe. The wind is blowing. The waves are beating into the ship to the point the Bible tells us they're beginning to fill up with water. And the disciples, they go down and they wake Jesus up. And do you remember what they said? Do you not care that we're perishing? We're dying and you don't care. Well, you know what happened. Jesus stood up. He rebuked the wind. Notice he didn't try to deal or manage or accept or cope with the wind and the waves. You know, storms are just a part of life. And we, we'll do good if we just learn to manage. Just accept it. Just cope. I'm going to go with Jesus. And what he did with it was resist it, rebuke it. And he spoke to it and he said, peace, be still. And then he turned around and he said to the disciples after there was some peace and some stillness, he said, listen, guys, I totally get it. I understand. Fear is just a part of life, man. Fear comes and you got to do your best to deal with it. I can deal with it. I'm God. You're not. No. What did he do? He rebuked them and said to them, asked them, how is it you are so full of fear? How is it you have no faith? This is correction. This is absolute a, a rebuke. It's correction. And one day I was reading this and the Lord put an emphasis on a word to me that I'd never really stopped to notice. And it was when Jesus said to them, how is it you have all this fear? Notice he didn't say this to the thousands that he was preaching to. This is a small group of people. These are the ones called alongside him. These are the ones that have heard and received the word. And he looks at him and he's like, can you please explain to me why you are, you of all people are yielding to fear? Where's your faith? And I know we've read that and thought, well, maybe he expected them to stand up and rebuke the, the wind. And, and maybe there is some truth to that. I, I don't know how they would have done that. They'd never seen him do it. So how do you know you can do it if you've never seen him do it? So where was their lack of faith? Where did fear get in? It was in these words. You don't care. We're dying and you don't care. Somebody help me out. How does faith work? Faith works by love. It comes by hearing, but it works by love or your faith will work when you know how much you're loved. That's the key to big faith, is to knowing how much you're loved. 
these guys, as soon as the storm hit, they questioned love. Have you noticed people do that? And believers do this? Something like what we saw this past week takes place and it's a it's tragedy. And people start going, I just don't understand. I just don't understand how a God of love I just don't understand. Have you heard this before? I just don't understand. I just don't understand. I just don't understand. <laughs> the answer is in what they're saying. You don't understand. <laughs> Acknowledge that. There's a lot you don't understand. So don't judge God just because you don't understand. There's a lot you don't know. There's a lot you don't know about what he said to people on the ground there. There's a lot you don't know about where he directed people to be. There's a lot you don't know about what he was able to do for some and what the, the door that had been closed to him in the lives of others. There's a lot you don't know. So yeah, you don't understand. But one thing you and I must never question and never doubt is how much he loves us. You want to resist fear? Find out how deeply, passionately, greatly you are loved. Because perfect love does what to fear? Casts it out. Gets rid of it. So what is fear? It's a feeling, right? No. It's an emotion? No. It's a spirit. And even when you're having some of the feelings that go with it, even when you're experiencing some of the emotions, emotions that go with it, you can still resist the spirit. You can still resist the spirit. What else is fear? It's a prison. And because of the work of Jesus, you are busting out of it. What else is fear? It's a magnet that's drawing destruction to you. So don't manage it. Don't accept it. Don't cope with it. Resist it. Conquer it. How do we do it? We do it by magnifying the Lord. We do it by using our words of faith. And we do it by believing how much we're loved. Amen. Amen. Stand up on your feet. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the house of faith.